I, I'm worried maybe I will be talking too much at the beginning. <laughs> Please feel free. We are here all to listen to you, actually. <laughs> exactly. The stage is yours, actually. So I'm, no, I'm going no. just to start streaming through that YouTube. I, I'm worried maybe I will be talking too much at the beginning. Please feel oh. free. We are here all to listen to you, actually. Yeah, uh, sorry. That must be a YouTube yours, talking. Uh, uh, so yeah. I'm, no. I'm going just to start stream. Yeah, good. All right. So uh, still we have two minutes. I was, uh, I was telling them uh, I'm also keen to, uh, to hear what you, you, you're going to say, Ike. Uh, you know, the trap, it's easy to do, but uh, it's hard to maintain. That's the, to, man to maintain the function. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, I wanted to, yeah, at UBC, I'll be speaking most about blebs. I, I will have a little bit on some of the new surgeries, but uh, the focus will be on, on blebs and traps. So, but I don't have the, I don't have all the answers, right? Allah knows best. <laughs> we'll do our best. Yeah. I said, if we find that, uh, mitomycin C alternative, you know, what that will give us less healing and less problems. Then... Yeah, this is this is the elusive, uh, elusive target. Um, there, there, there's some interesting uh, possibilities, actually. So um, maybe I should just test my test my uh, screen to make sure it's make sure it shares eh? yeah, yeah, please. Optimize. Here we go. We can see your screen. Uh, do okay. you have videos? Yes, I'll play. I'll play a video. Yeah, and uh, any voice with the video? No, I'll, it'll just be me talking here. Okay, great. Is the video playing okay? I've optimized for video sharing. Yes, it is. Okay. 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 Yeah. Very nice. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Stop share. So this first section, it should be how long, would you say? Uh, let's say it is one hour, but um, if it goes beyond a little bit, maybe 15 minutes, if we have questions and answers, it's up to you. Oh, yeah, I don't want to talk too long. Otherwise, people will get bored. So I will, um, I will try to keep it within like 45 minutes or something. And maybe then people can have questions. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. This is good. Yeah. Thank you very much. And of course, I'd like to hear from all of your your feedback, right? Your uh, you know, your challenges and your uh, criticism. Sure. No worries. Uh, we 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 actually uh, we arranged such things. So uh, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <good. laughs> I think uh, we can start now uh, because it is ten thirty one. Let's say. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you are, and welcome to the second session of Taming the Monster with. Uh, our uh, great speakers and panelists. And today we are with uh, Aiki Ahmed. Dr. Aiki Ahmed, of course, is very well known. And um, let me just introduce him. Um, he is an assistant professor in the, at University of Toronto. And he is uh, the research director in Kensington Eye Institute at the University of Toronto. And he is a leader in novel treatments for glaucoma, cataract, and lens implantation surgery. So, uh, Dr. Aiki Ahmed, um, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Mazin. Um, Assalamualaikum to uh, you and all my fellow, fellow panelists uh, and those that are attending as well. Uh, it's really an honor to, uh, to be here. Um, I mean, there are some fantastic speakers that are present here, and it's such an important topic that we're speaking about in glaucoma, and I'll be speaking primarily about surgery. But one of the, uh, one of the most uh, gratifying things for me will be to do something here with, uh, with Mazin. Um, and Mazin Sinjab has been such a pioneer in uh, our field. I don't know him so much personally, but I know when I watch and I observe him, and you know, you can learn a lot about a man by how he uh, teaches and his dedication and his passion to teaching, but also his humanity, I think. And there's something I'm sure, I don't know Mazin so well, but I'm sure when I know his journey to where he has come to 2021 today, and from when he was a young youngster, he's still young, but when he was a youngster, 
And I'm sure the trials and tribulations and the learning experiences that he's had to get here, uh, no doubt uh, it is something that we will all, we would all be inspired for. So uh, Mazin, I do want to thank you. Though. I want to take, the, take just a few minutes to thank you because uh, I don't know how you find the energy, the dedication to do so much hard work. So Jazakallah here for sharing all your knowledge to the world and for inviting me here and wishing everybody who is uh, celebrating the month of Ramadan, uh, Ramadan Kareem to everybody and uh, all the best. Um, we've been fasting here. I've been fasting today. So, our, so what is it now? Our fifth day, sixth day now, I guess here. And um, I was working out, running. Uh, we still do our work, of course. So my mouth is a little bit dry, but this is the blessings from all of, of having the time of Ramadan here. So forgive me if I if I am a little bit uh, hoarse in my voice, but uh, my, my love for teaching and being here is is, uh, is ever present. So let me start. Um, I know we have uh, really um, a great group of uh, people here, and I will uh, I will try to uh, share with you uh, some of my um, some of my experiences with um, with bleb surgery. And uh, many of you may know, of course, my interest in glaucoma surgery and my interest particularly in new glaucoma surgery. In fact, when I started my career, my career was to try to abandon the bleb. Um, but of course we realized the bleb is still a very important part of our glaucoma armamentarium. And although Trebek Lex has been around for a long time, I like to share with you some of our own personal anecdotes as well as some of the evidence around the ideal bleb management. Uh, I'll focus on blebs in general, some of the basic science. I'll focus on trabeculectomy because I think this is universally applicable. And I will touch on tube shunts and I will then also uh, talk about some of the novel bleb surgeries, which is where I have spent lots of time and interest and now has become my most common glaucoma surgery. Uh, it isn't MIGS, it isn't angle surgery, it isn't trabeculotomy, it is subconjunctival surgery, particularly uh, Preserflow and Zen, just to name a few devices uh, that are similar to trabeculectomy but may have some advantages. These are some of my disclosures that I list here and I do work with many companies to try to advance our field. They also serve as a conflict of interest, so please take my, uh, my knowledge in uh, whatever the best light is and I hope inshallah it's the is the, is the most uh, evidence-based and hopefully the right knowledge, but of course I can make mistakes. So please uh, correct me if I do. This is uh, a view of Toronto. And uh, I hope, well, G'day's been here. He's been, he did his training here in Toronto, uh, but I hope many of you have a chance to visit one day, inshallah, and please, please come. We have a very strong community here, um, very diverse community. So this is just a, a, a little slide taken from the American Glaucoma Society position paper on MIGS, which is minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. And you can see that traditional glaucoma surgery is on the right, and we can divide them up between bleb forming that is at the limbus and bleb procedure that is equatorial. Typically, for example, Ahmed, Bervelt, Maltino devices are more of the uh, equatorial drainage devices. And then we have bleb forming devices that are near the limbus. Trabeculectomy, of course, is our standard, but we also have other newer devices as well, which are listed here, but they do not have reservoirs. One big difference between some of the micro implants and some of the larger tube shunts is the fact that the large tube shunts have a reservoir. So it's just important to have a little idea about what we're focusing on today. I'm not focusing on the left side of this slide, which is more on the MIG side, which is more ab internal trabeculotomy, uh, cutting, dilating, stenting the canal of Schlem, enhancing physiologic outflow, superciliary outflow. This is all very exciting, but I'm not going to focus on this. Those procedures at this point in time are less powerful, but they still have an important role in my practice, actually, because not every patient needs to have a very low pressure, which we, of course, have to do for bleb surgery. And these are just some of the different ways to divide up some of the, some of the procedures. I talked about MIGS, Shems Canal, supracroidal, and then there are some of the minimally invasive bleb surgery. This is, these are new bleb procedures that we'll speak about. And again, I'm gonna focus on the bleb as well. And just to show you some of the potency of the procedures, FACO can lower pressure modestly, MIGS can lower pressure modestly, minimally invasive bleb surgery is more powerful and the trabeculectomy is the most powerful. And this is how we use procedures for patient selection. 
Um, in my practice, I am very procedure heavy. I do lots of surgery because I don't believe that eye drops chronically are the best treatment for glaucoma. Um, they are certainly the mainstay, the gold standard, and it's not wrong to start people on drops, but I am somebody who typically does laser trabeculoplasty, SLT, for example, very commonly as first line. And I will move to glaucoma surgery earlier than later, considering the problems with compliance and adherence and side effects. Of course, doing trabeculectomy in everybody first line is more of a, of a, of a challenge and a, and a concern because of the complications of the surgery. But of course, for patients who need it, who need very low pressure, it's an option. But that's really where MIGS has come along to be a middle ground. And again, I won't speak much more about this because my talk is really focused on to bleb or not to bleb, right? And we're talking about bleb. And the question is, is the subcon space the best place to augment aqueous outflow? We do know that the bleb is the most consistent way to lower pressure to the low teens to 12 or lower, or even single digits. And this is something that we know is really uh, the mainstay of the powerful procedures that we have. But there are many ways to create a bleb. And you can see that we have the traditional trabeculectomy. We have our express device, which we saw some interest, but has, has started to die down a bit. And then we see non-penetrating surgery, which in some parts of the world is still popular, but technically is demanding. Uh, I did a lot of non-penetrating surgery, but for some time now I've moved more toward using micro implants for my procedures, which I find to be as effective, but less technique dependent and with more posterior bleb formation. We'll speak about this. And of course, we still have our tube shunts, which we use for more high risk patients. Let me just state that trabeculectomy is still the gold standard in the 21st century and beyond so far, because the pressure lowering and the success rate is unparalleled with any surgery. And I think that is something that has stood the test of time so far. There certainly are complications. The complication rate has come down over the years, but a bleb is a bleb and a bleb can still run into problems early and late. There can be short-term complications that can be devastating and long-term complications that could be devastating. So this is something that we still cannot avoid and we are trying to move forward to reduce these complications. But the one thing that is very important with these surgeries is the post-operative intervention. You can see the high number of post-operative interventions that were required to achieve the kind of success that you saw on that graph. We cannot just put, a, put do the procedure and expect that the procedure will work on without maintenance post-operatively. And that's important, of course, to know. So how do we make blebs better? What's the ideal bleb? How do we make surgery more predictable and reduce the risk, shorten the recovery, and make them last longer? And that's sort of what I want to speak about. So this is all about optimization. It's about optimizing the preoperative preparation for the patient. It's about optimizing the intraoperative surgical technique. And it's about optimizing post-operative management. These are all key parts to bleb optimization. When we think about it to the layperson, we don't need to drain lots of aqueous, right? We need to drain about three cc's of aqueous per day. Doesn't sound like a lot, but of course, this is our holy grail. And the three primary mechanisms for aqueous outflow once we create a bleb has been felt to be transconjunctival through the conjunctiva microcyst formation and transconj flow, reabsorption through the venous system, all the aqueous veins that are around. And we also think that the lymphatics are important as well for outflow. This is a nice video from Dow Yu from Australia, just to showing passage of aqueous or fluorescein in the eye outside and we can see the bleb formation transconj. We can see the venous outflow in these straight vessels going posteriorly. And these horizontal vessels here are the lymphatics. This nicely shows the three different mechanisms of aqueous outflow, all dependent on different factors to ensure long-term success. The mechanism of outflow in most bleb surgeries is typically through a single channel that drains through the flap into a network of loosely packed collagen and hopefully minimal thick fibroblasts. Now it's interesting because most of us, when we do surgery, we think, oh, look, we have a flap, we have flow around the flap, we have diffuse filtration, 
And that certainly is ideal for the early post-operative period. But long-term, most of the flap will seal down. And in the end, we will basically have one track that basically matures, that drains the fluid from the flap. The rest of the flap is typically sealed down. Anybody who has done a blood revision knows this, that typically it's a single, typically 50 to 100 micron track that forms from one edge of the flap that drains into the bleb. The rest of the flap scars down. Remember that. Maybe most people don't think that, but that is what the reality is. And OCT images nicely show these tracks. They show fluid-filled spaces in the subscleral space connecting to the subconjunctival space with OCTs that we see that kind of nicely show this. We prefer to have blebs that have fairly normal conjunctival epithelial cells with more optically clear microcysts and less and less variable density goblet cells for ideal function. When we have abnormalities on the conjunctival surface, this can lead to failure. And looking at reflectivity, polarization sensitive OCT, looking at birefringence, we can see that blebs that work best have less thick and looser collagen, collagenase bleb walls and less birefringence. This typically means a more porous bleb. And bleb porosity, which I have to give credit to Michael Coote and others, is really the right term we're looking for. We don't need a huge bleb. We don't need a big bleb. We don't need to have a large bleb. We need to have a bleb that has good bleb porosity, but isn't so avascular as a leak and, and cause infection. I mentioned before that lymphatics are important as well. We don't talk about lymphatics. They've been shown in monkeys um, and, and also in animal eyes, and they've been seen in human eyes as well. And these are just some examples of staining of lymphatics. This video here just shows you if you look closely, you can see these linear horizontal striations on the conjunctiva when we increase filtration in the subcon space showing these lymphatics. And these lymphatics are important for aqueous alpha. We don't think about it, but this is important to understand when we create blebs. And you'll see what I'm talking about as we go forward. These are macrocysts that form, you can see here, basically showing subconjunctival macrocysts which relate to conjunctival lymphatics. And these are, again, felt to be important for aqueous outflow, even from the conventional outflow system from Shems Canal and the conjunctival and aqueous veins. So it's helpful to know that. We all know we create many blebs, but the question is, is a bleb a bleb? They're all different in their own ways. The ideal bleb is one that is posterior, diffuse, microcystic with limited vascularity, but not so thin and avascular, it's gonna leak and cause infection. We want to avoid these anterior localized blebs that have a ring of steel, that are time bombs, that are cystic, that can basically lead to long-term complications. And to me, the number one secret of success to avoid those blebs is one, understanding tenon's anatomy, and two, using mitomycin over diffuse area. And I think those are very important aspects of how do we create diffuse blebs. Tenon's capsule is something that most glaucoma surgeons don't talk about maybe enough. We know that tenon's is fairly adherent, about a millimeter from the limbus, and becomes thicker as it goes farther posterior and less adherent to the sclera. This just shows you conjunctival dissection off of tenon's, which is potential space. And we can show tenon's here, visible here. You will see that tenons plays an important role with subconjunctival filtration. Tenons is not necessarily our enemy, which many people do think. I am not one, for example, to do a tenonectomy for most cases, although I will say for younger patients with darker pigmentation, black patients, sometimes you have to do a tenonectomy. In those cases, I do a very large excision to avoid a small area of filtration that can cause avascularity. But most of the time, we keep tenons. And this is also important as we think about uh, micro, micro shunts and micro shunts. Let's just show our standard trabeculectomy. This is my fellow operating. I had to tell her to get the microscope in focus when we started, so that's why it's a bit out of focus. But we typically make a limbal peritomy. We typically work in the supranasal quadrant, slightly biased toward 12 o'clock, so we don't want to go too nasal. 
And we typically open about two clock hours, lifting the conjunctiva. And now you can see the conjunctiva has been cut, but we also are cutting tenons. It's important to disinsert tenons at the, at the near limbal insertion. When we do this, tenons retracts posteriorly. It's important, I believe, to grab tenons and isolate it and do not do blunt, blind dissection without making sure we're under tenons because that will prevent bleeding, that will prevent traumatization of tenons. And you can see we're continuing to go back and grab tenons. We don't want to pull yet because tenons is still not fully released, but we will dissect posteriorly. And this is a step I feel is very important because we don't want to just open the conjunctiva and shove the Westcott scissors back there and traumatize tenons and then make it difficult to close. You can see that we have now isolated tenons. We can do this for every case. And if you decide to, you can always cut tenons if you wish, although I don't typically do that, as I mentioned for most cases. And placing the scissors bluntly closed and swiping left and right here, avoids traumatizing the superectus muscle. Now look, at this is mitomycin. We typically inject mitomycin with a cannula, you can see. We use a 0.4 milligrams per cc dose, minimum is 0.4, and we inject about 0.2 cc's and we leave it there. We don't typically use sponges in these cases. We, we don't believe it's important to use sponges. The risk of injecting mitomycin C is no greater than using sponges, but in fact, the predictability is better and the risk of sponge loss is eliminated. And we typically find more diffuse blebs and less encapsulation has been shown in some studies. So now we can create our scleral flap. And for this one, I would say that really you can do what you're most um, comfortable doing. We typically make a rectangular flap, but notice that the flap is not going to be cut all the way to the limbus. We're, we're cutting to the posterior limbus, the end of the blue zone. Remember the blue zone is visualized here just behind the clear corneal zone. And the end of the blue zone basically lines up to the anterior trabecular meshwork. Typically we make a scleral cut down here. This is about three and a half millimeters long, three and a half long. And you saw here the mark is about two millimeters back from the end of the blue zone. And then we dissect and tunnel forward with a, with a, with a crescent blade. This is basically a tunneling technique, although you can, we can also do a direct visualization technique. And we basically tunnel forward until we reach the clear cornea. As we reach the limbal area, the blue zone, it's important to put the heel down and the, and the tip up to avoid perforation. And we can nicely place the blade through the tunnel into cornea, as we see here. We like to get into the anterior uh, uh, limbal area, uh, at least into clear cornea. That's where our ostium will be to avoid making a posterior opening where we can get bleeding by hitting the ciliary body. We make the uh, radial incisions and you can see a nice smooth bed because of the tunneling technique. And I think that's one of the advantages of that technique. It's always helpful to ensure that we have a side port made so we can take BSS. And we will pre-place sutures here using 10-0 nylon suture. We then enter the eye through the anterior dissection. As we mentioned earlier, this is using a, a, a zap knife or a keratome or any kind of knife blade that can be used and go across. And then we typically use a single punch to make an opening through. This is, this is typically a near clear corneal bite. We don't need to grab the sclera here, ideally. Just get that limbal area that's enough. And we see we have about a 0.5 millimeter um, to one millimeter opening. It's typically what we need. This is a crozophon de long uh, punch. You can do decimate punch, and there we go. Now, doing an aerodectomy is optional. We don't always do an aerodectomy. Here we will. But in a pseudophagic eye, I don't believe this is necessary in most cases. As long as the, the, uh, the, the trabeculostomy here is made anterior enough, we should be okay. So we do aerodectomy by using a pair of vanna scissors, make a broad aerodectomy by cutting across the iris, and then we can basically re-suture, uh, sorry, close the sutures by doing a slip knot. Slip knots are ideal. We find these are, are easily able to titrate the tension. So we'll do a slip knot there. We check the flow. We can tighten and loosen the flow based on what we see. I like to see some flow when the pressure is approximately running at 15 to 20. I'm one to not see the flap shut down with physiologic pressure. But of course, we prefer to prevent excessive flow, preventing hypotenuse. This is the art of surgery, of course. And we will then lock the sutures. Now, finally, I'm going to just talk about our closure. 
This is where, again, we go back and we grab TNOS. Many people don't do this, but I like to bring TNOS forward. And this allows the bleb to be very diffused and posteriorly driven. We're using a nino suture placed to the conjunctiva and also placed through the corner of TNODs. And this allows the bleb to form under TNODs. Many people argue, well, the TNODs is going to scar the bleb down. But remember, we have used a high concentration of mitomycin C, which will control the wound healing. And if we cut TNODs and make a small tenectomy, we risk the concern of creating a small avascular bleb with a cystic area with a ring of steel around it where the tenons was cut. So I do prefer to do this. And again, like I said, for maybe a young patient with darker pigmentation, uh, like under 30, under 40, we may do a tenectomy, but it's gonna be a very large tenectomy. It's basically gonna be almost one quadrant. So at least the bleb will be diffusely formed. I am not a fan of making a small tenectomy. I think that's a recipe for problems. And I see most surgeons out there to be, to be fair, do this if they do a tenectomy. I'll be interested in hearing what the panel feels about this, but this is what our closure is. And we can see a very nice diffuse bleb that forms. There's a lot of discussion and computational modeling on the ideal bleb size. And basically we are looking for, again, a combination of size and area and porosity. And this does relate, of course, to the diffuseness of the bleb and the flow rate that we established in the early postoperative period. And this, of course, also relates to wound healing, which is critical to control intraop and postop. Why do we want a posterior bleb? Well, this is the area where the, where the conjunctiva is less metabolically active. We're less prone to ocular surface trauma, some protection from the lid. There is more lymph lymphatics back there, less tenons attachments, and a larger surface area, and more comfortable. This is the ideal bleb formation. And we have to give Pencock credit for the ideas behind this particularly, I would say, in treating with a large area mitomycin. That's why we inject mitomycin, because we find that by injecting it, we really create a nice diffuse area of application to allow the flow to occur and minimize bleb healing over that area. In the end of the day, it's about bleb survival. Like I said, there are many things we need to do to ensure the bleb survives in the early post-operative period. What makes a bleb fail? Um, there are many different areas. I want to credit Allah Mufti, one of my former fellows who is uh, now in, uh, in Jeddah in Saudi for, uh, for putting together some of these slides as well. And he's on his way uh, to do great things. But there are many different aspects. And the slide speaks for itself, age, race, new vascularization, uveitis, previous conjunctival trauma. All these can risk failure. And we have to address these proactively. When it comes to understanding the way that wounds heal, we have to take our information from the dermatologic and the plastic surgery world, where we have four or five different phases of wound healing. We have the clotting vascular phase. We have the inflammation, which is the first, within the first 24, 48 hours. We have the, the, the inflammatory phase of inflammation, which is the first two weeks. We have the fibrovascular proliferation phase, which is typically four weeks. And remodeling occurs after that time, chronically and over time for the first few months, certainly. We have to try to control each phase to reduce the risk of scarring and reduction of function. How do we do this? Well, of course, it means we have to address inflammation early on, preventatively. We have to address bleeding. I am one to do cautery as needed using ideally, as you may have seen, a very fine 23 gauge cautery device. This prevents the, uh, the recruitment uh, of inflammatory mediators that can lead to inflammation and scarring. Proliferative phase has to be addressed. And this is of course, most effective with steroids. Our anti-metabolites can be helpful and also other anti-growth factors can be used as well. Anti-VEGF, like Avastin, has also been talked about in the early post-operative period and may have a role, but not as potent as mitomycin C. And the remodeling phase is something that we continually see, of course, in the post-operative period. This is less from an inflammatory perspective, but more as more a physiologic collagen remodeling phase, which, uh, of course, is, is somewhat dependent on the activity of, of the cells. 
So how do we address these issues? Well, the first point is to address preoperative inflammation. And we know that our medications can be quite toxic to the surface of the eye. I do like to hold, if I can, alpha agonists and prostaglandins and any other drug that's causing a problem. Of course, the pressure may go up, so we have to put patients on oral acetazolamide. But this is worth it, in my opinion, to reduce the risk of scarring and to prevent bleeding. We also have to reduce BAK, preservative, so it's good to go preservative-free. And we use topical steroids routinely uh, before surgery, typically one week before surgery. A drop of phenylephrine is helpful as well to address uh, hyperemia and vasoconstriction. I do like to use steroids. Uh, typically, I use Pretfort for a, for a week, but if the eye is pretty red, I will use something like FML, a, a, a less potent steroid, at least in terms of IOP spikes, or Lodopredinol for one month, because I do believe that this shows goes, goes on a cellular level reduction of inflammatory cells and fibroblasts in conjunctiva. And clinically, it's also been shown to reduce the risk of post-operative scarring and needling. So topical steroids routinely preoperatively are important. This is our algorithm for preoperative bleb surgery. You can see we address all the aspects of potential risk of scarring, vasodilation, allergy, dry eye ocular surface and lid margin disease. We stop drops, we go to oral acetazolamide, we use topical steroids, like I said, preservative free medications. We use non-preserved supplements like gels, uh, cyclosporin A possibly to address ocular surface issues and inflammation. And we use lid hygiene, oral doxycycline as well and topical steroids as needed. We need to initiate, initiate these therapies before surgery. Operating on an eye with subclinical or clinical inflammation is a recipe for failure. So that's important in doing this. There are many different interventions that we use, of course, intraoperatively and postoperatively. Most of you know about steroids and anti-metabolites, of course, as well. Mitomycin C, of course, uh, impacts all phases of the cell cycle as opposed to 5-FU. And it's about 100 times as potent as 5-FU in the doses we use in the eye. But they both act somewhat differently in terms of how they work. And so we typically use mitomycin intraoperatively. Again, like I said, we typically are using 0.4 milligrams per cc, either delivered by an injection or by a sponge. Or uh, we basically use a higher dose for high-risk cases. 5-FU we do use postoperatively. So I do inject 5-FU after surgery when I feel the eye has lots of hyperemia or the bleb is starting to thicken. And we've seen the evidence that mitomycin does reduce the risk of these risk factors for fibrosis um, by using mitomycin C. So I think most of us use mitomycin C routinely. Postoperatively, we go high dose steroids, typically Q2 hours for one week, QID for three weeks, and then do a slow taper over a few months, depending on the inflammation on the eye. It does help to evaluate the bleb postoperatively by whatever grade system we use, particularly vascularity and thickening. This is what I try to teach our fellows to assess the thickening of the bleb. You can see subconjunctival thickening, move the conjunctiva over the flap, see how much is stuck down, see how much vascularity there is. If there's, if there's too much vascularity or thickening, this patient should receive multiple 5-FU injections after surgery. 50 milligrams per cc injected into the bleb, and we'll do this routinely. It's important, though, these patients can have corneal toxicity. So we use lots of lubrication, and we have to wash the cornea carefully. We have our own bleb, bleb scoring system, but I recommend that basically it's ideal to use some system to document the bleb, to follow patients, as we do. I'm a big fan of documentation and monitoring for research, but also to allow us to make clinical decisions rather than being arbitrary. It's also important. We have a teaching program with residents and fellows, so we're all speaking the same language. Now, why do blebs contract? Well, this is typically a multifactorial phenomena related to inflammation, fibroblast proliferation, mechanical resistance, and episcleral fibrosis. I, I have a big uh, make a big effort to save the bleb when I feel that the bleb is scarring down. And I like to enhance blebs, like I said before, with 5-FU. Suture lysis, of course, is important. We not, need to talk about this. And I find suture lysis is most effective if done within one to three weeks. Before that, we risk hypotony. After that, I think that the effect is not as great. Now, that depends on the patient. 
Typically, we'll do a bit of bleb massage to see whether the bleb opens up very fast. If it does, maybe wait to do the, the uh, suture lysis. But um, watch the patient closely. Patients need to have weekly follow-up at least, which is a pretty intense. But if the bleb has already failed and the pressure is already up and it's been, you know, after the attempts of suture lysis and everything else, then we have to do some things to try to salvage the bleb. Uh, I am one to typically use bleb needling approaches. I do bleb needling a lot. It's interesting that many glaucoma specialists don't do any bleb needling. I do a lot of bleb needling at the slit lamp. I use a lot of mitomycin. Uh, and I use a 25 or 27 gauge needle to enter the eye. Choose your best weapon, a 25 gauge needle. Uh, one is able to uh, you know, swipe back and forth. A needle is better to penetrate, but doesn't allow the ability to cut laterally. So consider using an MVR blade. Uh, it's a bit of a bigger condensation, but if you make it far enough away, you can do this. This bleb has failed. We can see Coming here basically here, all the way down. lamp. And we're going to take, first of all, we're going to inject some mitomycin C. This is 0.5 milligrams per C. I injected posteriorly. Let me tell you one thing. Don't worry about mitomycin going into the eye because it won't. And sorry, it does, but not at high enough concentration. Even with sponges, we have mitomycin penetrating into the eye. But this is not going to directly drain into the eye. We have a, we have a fibrose bleb and we need to get mitomycin where it has to go. And I inject mitomycin for the last 15 years intraoperatively, postoperatively, we have not seen a problem. So this is something that we would do routinely, although many, many people are scared. Uh, we're talking about glaucoma surgery here and we do this routinely. So there's the injection. Wait 20 minutes for the bleb to kind of do it. guard out, uh, bleb to kind of diffuse down. Straight down, way down as low as you can. And that. now this is the soot lamp. We'll take that 27 gauge needle. We'll get around and here's the flap. We'll get the needle under the flap and we poke back and forth, back and forth like a postage stamp to make multiple punctures at the posterior edge of the flap right there. And we can go left and right, but because the edge of the needle is not sharp, typically we don't get, you know, cutting effect. But we go back and forth, back and forth, and then we penetrate in through the flap into the anterior chamber, as you can see there. And we see the bleb form nicely, which is great. And go back and forth a few more times, I will say there's an art to this because how do I know I'm not going to enter the ciliary body? How am I not going to enter the, enter the cornea? It's all about entering at the right place, feeling your way around and angling the needle at the right direction, which I will admit takes a bit of uh, perspective and some experience. But I love to do this. We do this all the time at the slit lamp when we have to. And our success rate has been about 60, 70%. It's worth doing it before putting people back on medication or going to do more surgery. But look at this bleb, how beautiful it's forming now. And it's very important. Your end point is the pressure should drop to almost hypotony. Down to three or four is fine. Because we know we want that flow to be very vigorous and we know the bleb will scar down uh, over time anyways. When needling has failed or the conjunctiva is so stuck, we do a bleb revision. And I have to say, I've been a fan of using Ologen, which is uh, extracellular matrix, uh, animal extracellular matrix, which does help, I believe, to control healing in many ways. This bleb is scarred down. We've attempted needling already, and I'm going to cut the conjunctiva, and I'm gonna undermine the conjunctiva by dissecting over the scar, over the scar with my blunt Westcott's, and I'm gonna then cut away the scar right over the flap. Okay, and you can see we're carefully dissecting the conjunctiva. Be careful not to buttonhole here. It is a bit bloody. Don't worry. We'll cauterize everything. It'll be fine. But now we can do an excisional approach. And you can see we, we dissect very far posteriorly and laterally. And there you can see uh, the, uh, the, the scar over the flap. We'll basically dissect it. This is basically like myofibroblast tissue. And we'll basically dissect... Uh, and cut. I know many people will give up on the bleb. I don't give up easily. I, I'm a fighter and I will fight for this bleb after needling and revisions because I want to save real estate if the patient needs more surgery later on. Look at the scar, right? Look at that thing. I got to basically cut that right off the flap. It's over the flap. I'm going to release that over the flap. And now you can see there's the flap, but it's still scarred down. 
So I make, a, I just, I just go back and cut over the posterior edge of the flap, a nice posterior uh, cut. And then we will basically find the edge of the flap. I'll inject some BSS. And also it's good to do a bit of intraoperative gonio. You can see the nice ostium there and, and the iridotomy done, iridectomy done. And we can now find the plane. I'm using a, um, a crescent blade. This happens to be a diamond, but we basically can now dissect forward and make sure that we have flow. And there's a blade into the eye, basically uh, re retracing the original uh, flap plane. Make a small radial on either side. And now we have a flap. We'll do our sutures. There's a slip knot. And basically this is doing, this is redoing it, redoing a, a, a trap. Sometime we open the, the scar tissue and the, and the flap is already flowing. In that case, we don't have to do another flap design dissection. But here, of course, the flap was shut down. And I inject and I check the, I check the flow. Just like I checked the flow for a, a primary trap, we check the flow after injecting. I'm going to loosen the slip knot. So now we can check the flow again and we have good flow. I'm going to basically a bit more aggressive here. This patient's already failed. I got to have good flow. I have to risk some early hypotony a little bit, maybe if it happens, but I need to have good flow because this patient's already at risk for failing. At this point, I have not used mitomycin yet, but I will do it now, as you'll see. And here I'm going to use three different delivery mechanisms. One is sponges, 0.5 milligrams per cc, put on the eye for two minutes. Mitomycin is a prodrug. It's broken down to its active molecule by the, by the human tissue in most patients. And typically, the tissue saturation levels off after about 90 seconds. After that, the tissue saturation is, has basically let, reached a steady state. So there's no real value in putting it there for longer, at least with sponges. I'm also going to inject mitomycin. This is mitomycin I'm injecting as well posteriorly. You're going to say, Ike, that's a lot of mitomycin. But yes, this patient is a high risk for scarring, and they've already failed surgery already. So I have to do more here. And I actually am not worried about a diffuse application. This is ologen. This is ologen. It's not mitomycin on a sponge. This is ologen. This is that extracellular matrix. And I'm also going to, you can see the, the bleb increase in size when I inject BSS. And I'm also going to do something else. I'm going to inject mitomycin into the ologen as well. And you can do five of you if you want to, but I do, my, I do mitomycin. So I've done a lot of mitomycin and I leave it there and I close the conjunctiva over. So this is basically a very aggressive bleb revision to ensure success. Let me just talk a little bit uh, for the last uh, 15 minutes or so on tube surgery and microchance, because of course, bleb surgery is not just trabecolectomy. Where do we do tubes? Is there a role for primary surgery versus refractory? Which tube? And other, other, other questions that are around it. So there are many different things about plates that we have to think about. Um, again, the benefit here, they're posterior. The plate acts as a scaffold to form a pseudocapsule, which is different than trabeculectomy. And we have to try to control wound healing, however, because this is still a risk for these patients. We have done studies showing that trabeculectomy is still the best surgery for primary filtering surgery compared to tube shunts, I should say. So TRABs are still ideal first line, but for refractory glaucoma, patients who have had previously failed glaucoma surgery or previous conjunctival surgery, tube shunts, particularly the Bearvelt 350, has been shown to have a higher success rate. What differentiate one tube from the next? Well, material, design, whether there's a valve or not, whether we close the tube for six weeks or not, and surgical technique. The big differences are between the Ahmed, which is valved and has early flow, and the Bearvelt. Most of us would agree the Ahmed does have more risk of encapsulation, and that probably relates to early aqueous flow. While the Bearvelt, we do a ligature to close the bleb for six weeks, preventing hypotony, but also allowing the capsule to form around the plate without the formation of aqueous. Aqueous in a glaucoma patient has inflammatory mediators, and just the mere presence of aqueous can simulate fibrosis in a patient. We have published some large studies looking at five-year results between Ahmed versus Bearvelt, and we have quite fairly good follow-up at five years for a study. 
And basically, we showed that the bear belt device does have an edge when it comes to success with lower pressures and a higher success rate. But the bear belt does have more complications. And so the Ahmed valve is a safer option for the uh, specific patient. One thing we know with the Ahmed valve is hyperencapsulation. And as Maltino has shown in others that this is probably because of early aqueous flow in the presence of a reservoir, of a plate. And what we find with Ahmed's, if we can treat the patient with medication and reduce the aqueous production, we can reduce the hypertensive phase and reduce the thickness of the bleb. And this is routinely what we do. We basically will start aqueous suppression after one week to prevent hypotony. We started after the first week and we aggressively treat the pressure to keep the pressure around 10. This may seem counter, counterproductive uh, because we're doing filtering surgery, but it does help in these Ahmed valves, not for traps, of course, but for Ahmed valves, we do this. We have seen, however, trabeculectomies going down over the many years, in the, in, in, certainly in the United States and in Europe, while tube stones have gone up. And I think many of us feel it's time for change, right? Trabeculectomies have been around for a long time. We have uh, you know, great corneal specialists here that uh, have really moved forward with uh, modern day corneal surgery, VR surgery has advanced, cataract surgery has and refractive has, but glaucoma surgery hasn't. So the last few minutes I wanna speak about is, is there a better, safer, more predictable way controlled to also create a bleb with less intensive follow-up? There are many alternatives that, we're, that we've discussed already, many ways to create a bleb, and I'm gonna focus on microstenting options. In a trabeculectomy, there are so many places of variability. As a surgeon, we don't like variability. Variability leads to then unpredictable results and less control. Control and predictability is, of course, a really important aspect for safety. It's also interesting in trabeculectomy, we have to continue to do more work after the surgery by doing suture lysis and everything else. We're basically chasing the patient. So the idea is, can we do something else that we don't have to be doing all these manipulations? That's still a question. But we have to compare any surgery we do to trabeculectomy. It has to have the same efficacy as trabeculectomy, but hopefully safer than trabeculectomy. Now, trabeculectomy results are modest. Most people will say, my trabeculectomy is amazing. But the reality is when you look at the published literature, at least so far, the success rate for trabeculectomy with a modest, a modest target of 17 or less is between 40 to 75%. These are prospective studies. And it's not 99%, as many people will say. And this is two-year data, not like six-month data even, or five-year data. Modern-day blebs are not just differentiated by IOP, but also by the bleb morphology, the predictability, the post-operative visits, and visual recovery. This is now how we need to define blebs. And this is how we're moving from the old school bleb surgery on the right, trabeculectomy tube shunts, to what I believe is the modern day bleb with some advantages using micro shunting technologies. Whether it's ab interno on the bottom with Zen or ab externo with pressure flow or formerly called in focus. In our practice, we do the two on the left predominantly because of how we've been able to maximize it. And this is what we call, you know, basically subconj MIGs or minimally invasive bleb surgery, where the microstenting protects us from hypotony, but allows us to still take advantage of the potency of a bleb and also to increase the mitomycin dose because we do it safer. And think about that. We still have to address wound healing by using mitomycin, but mitomycin becomes safer because the procedure is safer. So think about that for a second. And both these devices, I think, have some advantages in that dimension. I am not going to go in lots of detail today because I don't want to spend more time than I have to. And also, we're focusing on blebs in general. But please look at some of our work that we published and some of the discussions I've had online about this. Because I do believe the time has come, and we've seen it in cataract surgery and cornea and VR and refractive, where size matters. 
Invasiveness matters, allowing us to do surgery earlier. This is important for glaucoma surgery as well, rather than leaving trabeculectomy till the very end. These are some graphs I've compiled from my practice with my help of my team here. This is IOP in the first two months. Trabeculectomy, 170 eyes, Zen in 185 eyes, and pressure flow in 196 eyes. Look how up and down the IOP is for trabeculectomy. Less so with Zen, even less so with pressure flow. I realize this is only two months, but why is this important? This is so important for our patients, for their recovery, for their quality of life, for the number of visits, for their visual recovery. In red is Zen, is, uh, is Zen in blue is pressure flow, micro, these are both micro stents. And in green is trabeculectomy. Baseline vision of better or worse than 0.4. Look at the look at the speed of recovery is faster and more complete with micro shunting than with trabeculectomy. This is important to our patients, not just with IOP, but also recovery. We have to also remember though that there are lots of things to think about when it comes to blood formation. Unlike early diffuse flow from a trabeculectomy, all the flow in a micro shunt is coming from one point. That's good and bad. It means that shunt has to be positioned properly. We have learned that we should not let the shunt be blocked by tenons. So we advise place the shunt either above or below tenons. For the Zen, for example, we are comfortable placing it above or below tenons, while pressure flow, we put it below tenons. That's important. The Zen device is calibrated based on the, the hagen Posel equation to limit the uh, hypotony by creating enough resistance based on the diameter of the tube, understanding aqueous production. And this allows us to prevent hypotony, which is huge, so we can be more aggressive with wound healing modifications. And the blebs are typically nice and diffuse because of the posterior filtration. Now, there are many ways to do Zen surgery, and we have generally moved more toward open conjunctiva procedures and often ab external. The ab internal approach is still something that we do use, but it's important if we do this to make sure we have a very mobile Zen device in the subcon space. And I will just make that point, but I won't go into too much surgical detail. We do believe the Zen has a benefit in terms of safety and recovery and versatility. And we have published a couple of big studies on this, which basically has shown that the Zen has some of these benefits. However, the Zen we have found does require more needling. This is a bit of a negative, but by advancing surgical technique or using alternative surgical techniques, we've been able to reduce the needling rates. Present flow is another option, which is really our most potent procedure we have yet, which is made of a polystyrene block compound, which is found to be very stable in the human body, used also in the, uh, in the coronary artery world, less likely to create secondary inflammation like silicone does. And we also see beautiful bleb formation. This procedure is done uh, by placing the device here outside the eye, and we then close teen on the conjunctiva over it. And it's really nice to see a posterior blood forming, but we have to use mitomycin. Again, we use good dose of mitomycin here. Like I said, very diffuse blebs. And they're so beautiful that we are comfortable using even scleral contact lenses or large diameter contact lenses. This patient, for example, has granular dystrophy of the cornea and uh, required to use these contact lenses, but the bleb was able to do and perform well. I will just point to a couple of our studies recently published uh, to show our IOP results. You can see a scatter plot showing the pressure results are very good and I believe can compete with trabeculectomy. The one thing we found, however, that mitomycin dosing is important with the present flow device. We need to make sure that we use a high dose of mitomycin. But the good thing is the complication rate doesn't go higher with more mitomycin with these micro shuts. We've also found the same excellent results with patients who have failed previous trabeculectomy or tube shunts as well. Again, showing excellent IAP results. And the nice thing about these patients are the recovery is so good, so smooth in the majority of patients 
It's almost like they've had cataract surgery. I'm kind of joking, but really it almost is. One thing we found with these procedures are we're able to actually increase the amount of mycin dose. And this sounds a bit interesting because you think we have more complications, but we don't. And that's because the procedure is safer because we always are gonna have an issue with wound healing. So just finally remember, as I finish my last couple of slides here, that we talk about BLEB in 2021, we have to think about the BLEB more than just survival, more than just IOP and meds, but beyond that, as I mentioned. Of course, we do a BLEB to maintain IOP, and so I hope I've been able to give you some thoughts in terms of improving long-term success. And I do believe microstenting options allow us to do this again in a more predictable fashion. I had to do, I, I've been a pleasure doing this talk. I, I, I want to just again thank the uh, invitation to be here. We um, always share our information as well. We're not as organized, as prolific as Mazin, but uh, we love to share. So please feel free to visit us online. Social media is a very powerful means to communicate. Uh, so please continue to do that. And I wish all of my friends I see from people around the world. Um, you know, the best. And uh, again, I want to give my greetings for the Holy Month of Ramadan, uh, the blessings of our fasting month, and uh, remembering those that are not as fortunate as us, people who are suffering in the world today, who are oppressed, people who are under occupation, people who are under repressive situations, may, may they be uh, free of the, of the problems that they have. Most of all, wishing peace and blessings to everybody. And thank you again, Zakla here. Thank you so much, Mazin, for the invitation. I hope that was somewhat coherent. I apologize, I'm fasting, so my, my voice is hoarse and my lips are dry, but I still appreciate the blessings of sharing knowledge, inshallah. Uh, MashaAllah, Dr. Ahmed, thank you very much. It has been a pleasure and honor having you on board. And uh, we would like to thank you very much for the very nice and wonderful talk. Uh, we learned a lot. And um, you highlighted uh, very important points regarding the BLEB 2021. And um, we have been watching actually how uh, you were struggling with the uh, dry mouth and talking while you are fasting. So thank you very much, God bless you. And we, we were watching as well uh, your, mashallah, golden, uh, golden uh, fingers doing the surgeries. So I would like to open the discussion for um, our great panelists, Dr. Uh, Qudeh and Dr. Munir, uh, to start uh, asking questions and uh, highlight important points. Please, thank Dr. Qudeh and Dr. Munir. Uh, thank you, Ike. That was a very enlightening lecture, and I learned tremendously from you. Thank you. Uh, I learned from you that uh, mycomycin C that I, I injected preoperatively in the preoperative area. And uh, I also watch now you do it uh, intraoperative where you, with that canyon, it's just diffuse, uh, put some uh, mito there. Do you wash it after or you leave it alone? Do, do you wash it with mito, uh, with, uh, with, with BSS? Yeah. No, thanks, Kadeh. And, and I mean, you 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 do so much surgery. You have so much observation, and I I look I always like to learn from your experience as well. So we have moved to using an intraop, and one reason is because if when I injected preoperatively, the tenons becomes very thick, and sometimes it becomes harder to dissect. So we have just moved to doing an intraop. Um, oh. I, and I and I actually don't do much washing. I don't. I know that people get scared about hearing this. But, uh, you know, I make sure it stays posterior. If it does come anterior, I do dab it away with the wex cell. And I will take the BSS and just wash a bit on the cornea. But, but I, I feel that the mitomycin, I want it to be there. It gets absorbed uh, fairly soon. Uh, and unless I have mitomycin all over the surface of the cornea, of course, I want to wash that. But in the, in the pocket I make, subtenon's pocket, as I, as I call it, I, I typically don't. Um, hi, hi, Ike. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I personally learned a lot. Uh, great tips and great uh, pearls, as usual, uh, from your presentation. Uh, in fact, if you allow me, I have a few questions uh, regarding the trap tube and the prison flow. So start from the, uh, the trap itself. Um, what's your protocol for the 5FU if you have inflamed eye after the, uh, the uh, inflamed bib, I mean, after the trap? And the other thing is, 
Do you believe in injecting subconch decks rather than 5 of you in early uh, days if you have very inflamed trout? Because my understanding, subconch decks could be um, sometimes more effective in these cases at early stage. Yeah, great point. I mean, we we do use subconscious steroid injections, dexamethasone, of course, shorter acting, and you can put it, you know, uh, it's not a precipitate, so you can put it near the bleb. And I agree, if the eye is looking pretty inflamed or the compliance isn't very good, I think it's a good idea to do this. So I like that idea. Um, I do worry about using Kenalog because the action is a bit longer and sometimes you get a steroid response. But dex, I think, is, is perfect for that. I agree. Um, in terms of 5-FU, yeah, we're aggressive. I'll inject it in the first, at three, four days even. Depending on how thick and how vascular the bleb is, I will even bring them back every other day. Uh, there's a certain limit, of course, as we know, because of the issues around cornea. So we teach our fellows to make a very long needle track, inject it slowly and come out very slowly, and then wash the eye. For 5-FU, there is a value in washing the eye as opposed to mitomycin, uh, because a 5-FU does have, of course, a lot of epithelial toxicity to the cornea. We also make sure we hold any non that the patient is using it, and we also keep the eye very lubricated proactively by using QID, uh, you know, tear gel and QHS lacquer lube uh, overnight to really keep the eye well lubricated. Because if the epithelium goes, we lose the benefit of having five of you in the eye because more inflamed. And we'll do like five or six or eight injections in the first few weeks if we have to. Fortunately, most patients don't need that much, but I, I will be careful. And if a patient is inflamed, we have to address it. Perfect. And uh, do you believe in applying the 0 0.5, 0 0.4 for every patient? Like, for example, Caucasian patient, myopic patients with low risk, uh, don't you prefer to use 0 0.2 or it's like standard use 0 0.4? Yeah, great. Very good point. Thank you for mentioning this. Uh, 0 0.4 for the majority, I'll say. Now, I will admit a, a, a myopic patient, I'll be careful. But to be honest with you, for myopic patients, I don't do trap. I don't do trap. I do a Zen or pressure flow, it goes very well in those eyes. But if I were doing a trab in myopic patients, I agree with you, I'd be very careful. I, I would suture the flaps tighter and I would use a lower dose of mitomycin initially if they were Caucasian. Also, same thing for an 80 year old patient, 85 year old patient, Caucasian. I would lower my dose to 0.2, as you said. But most of those patients, again, I typically use micro shunting. I just find micro shunting works very well in those patients. They don't need a pressure of eight. They're happy with a pressure of 13. And a Zen or Preservo works very well in those patients. That's kind of been my practice, at least here. Perfect. And uh, talking about the micro shunting for preserve flow, do you believe in leaving the helon in the AC and under the conge after putting the preserve flow to reduce the early hypotony, or you don't think it's necess necessary? So good question. I mean, I, you're, you're asking great questions, but I, I, I appreciate you're you're a thoughtful man, and that's fantastic. Um, so a couple of things, not in the anterior chamber. Um, in fact, if you put if you put heel on the anterior chamber, the risk is of an IOP spike that can happen. So we don't do that. Now you make an interesting point about subcon space, and there's certainly been published work on the benefit of having cohesive viscoelastic under the conjunctiva after surgery immediately, or even after needling, to keep the space. And I don't do that routinely, but I will do that again in a high risk eye, maybe someone that I've been needling a lot aggressively. Uh, and I basically leave a, leave a, um, a viscoelastic under the conjunctiva temporarily. That does not cause IOP spike because, it, again, it's very diffuse. It, it, uh, the hyaluronidase breaks down the, the, uh, the hyaluronic acid very quickly. And it's not like in the eye where you can get an IOP spike. So that's been my experience with subconj viscoelastic. Perfect. And uh, sorry, last question. Uh, if for the, uh, to prevent or stop the risk of the encapsulation after Ahmad valve early days, do you believe in using COSOP as an aqueous suppressant uh, during the early stage? 100%. And there's been three groups, including ours, that have shown this. That if you aqueous suppress the patient for the first four to six weeks, the encapsulation, the thick tenon cyst is reduced. This, because we have less aqueous, less pressure head into the, into the bleb forming over the plate. We will use COSOP. We will use acetazolamide if we have to. Prostaglandins even if we have to to lower the pressure down to 10 or 12. Now, I don't use it on post-op day one because I don't want to, I don't want to have hypotony. Uh, by the way, I leave Provis or I leave Helon in the anterior chamber after an Ahmed. I don't know what you guys do. I know Gade does a lot of Ahmeds as well, but that prevents hypotony. But I'll wait for the first four or five days so the pressure stabilizes around 10 or 12. Then I will start aqueous suppressing them and bring them back frequently and keep the pressure controlled. Um, I believe that's a big benefit to reduce encapsulation with Ahmed valves. 
Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure. Great, great questions. We could, uh, we could go through this a lot, and I'm sure you could teach me a lot more about these things. No, no, no. no, it's, no, no. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Uh, now we will go through some questions, very few questions. Uh, how to prevent endophthalmitis? This is a question for, from Selma. I think she meant uh, when you do needling on the sleet, sleet lamp, how do you prevent endophthalmitis? Yeah, endophthalmitis, um, of course, is a known complication of bleb surgery. Um, it can happen early or late. I think with a needling procedure, uh, I don't worry about endophthalmitis from the needle track. I mean, I'm making a needle track. It's long. It's with a 27 gauge needle and it seals up pretty quickly. So it might, there might be an early leak. I put them on antibiotics for a week. I have betadine prep. When I do the slit lamp, I put betadine on the eye. I do the needling there. And I mean, you know, alhamdulillah, I haven't had uh, an infection from the needling. However, of course, with a thin avascular bleb, this is a risk. Um, and that, of course, can be avoided by having proper t nons closure. After needling, it's a little bit harder to control because, of course, we are basically injecting mitomycin and doing needling. That is one of the risks that we find. I think the most important thing is, I believe, is to have a nice diffuse posterior, posterior injection of mitomycin, as you saw in my video, so it's posterior, and ensuring the flow is diffuse. And therefore, it's not localized over a small area where the conch can get very thin because of the focal force of the aqueous. So those things can reduce the risk, but they don't eliminate it. Great, another question uh, from Sufyan. Uh, do you advise combined surgery, phaco trab? or only phaco surgery in cases of glaucoma with moderate uh, defect? Great question. Well, in my hands and also from other publications, it's a bit controversial. Phaco trap success rate is not as successful as trabeculectomy. There's more, more blood aqueous disruption, more inflammation, and the traps have more chance of failing. So if I can avoid doing phaco trap, I prefer it. But doing a phaco after a trap also risks, of course, failure. So if the patient has a cataract and the main purpose is a cataract and the, and the glaucoma is controlled somewhat, then I will do a phaco alone. I'll often combine it with MIGS, even using a suture trabeculotomy, you can do this around the world or using stents, and then see how the pressure stabilizes for the first three, four months. If the pressure is still not controlled, then I do trabeculectomy. But by then the blood aqueous barrier is now stabilized. Now this is difficult for patients because doing two surgeries is not always easy. So sometimes we have to just bite the bullet and do a phaco trap and understand the patient will require more 5-FU and more likely to needle and important to use mitomycin. And I typically use, again, 0.4 milligrams per cc of mitomycin to help address the increased risk of healing after a phaco trap and to use steroids and NSAIDs for longer, for three, four months after phaco trap that I don't always do for traps. Great. Um, there is a question in tube surgery. Do you use mitomycin C? Yeah, great question again. Um, I don't routinely, and this is still a matter of debate. Previous studies from Vital Cost and others have shown that mitomycin doesn't help us in control, but that was a single application at the time of surgery. Other, other, others like Professor Han from UCSF have shown that injecting mitomycin C at the time of surgery, one week, and one month, three times, multiple times, may increase the success rate. But that success rate increase is not so huge. So I'm not convinced anti-metabolites are really important with 2% surgery. That's my own opinion and my own experience, but I will say that there are some people who really advocate for it. Great. Uh, a question from Waz by in focus, what about endothelial cell loss? Good question, Waz. In focus also now rebranded as Preserflow is that micro shunt I showed at the end. It's a longer device in the anterior chamber. The key is the device should be placed deep in the anterior chamber at the, at the iris plane, not up toward the cornea. And so far the studies have shown, at least based on some US data, that the effective loss of cells is similar to trabeculectomy. Meaning even after trabeculectomy, actually any filtering surgery, we have endothelial cell loss, likely because of the change in the way the aqueous flow is and other factors. But the, the loss is, doesn't seem to be greater with in-focus than with traps so far. With almonds and bare belts, however, with a bigger tube, the risk is higher as we know. So this is something that's still playing out. We'll see. But in my experience, it has not been an issue. Great. Now, a question from Okan. Uh, Ozturk, I think he is from Turkey. What's your first surgical approach to primary open angle glaucoma under 
55 year old without cataract? Well, my first approach would be based on severity. If the patient is under 55 or let's say under 50 and has mild to moderate disease, I am not doing bleb surgery. I am doing an abinternal trabeculotomy. I'm using, in my hands, I use the eye track or you can use a suture like a 5 proline to do 360 degrees GAT. I typically don't do 360, I typically do a 180 and I'll do viscodilation with viscoelastic inside the catheter I use called the eye track and I place a couple of stents. So I cut the canal, I dilate the canal viscoelastic and I stent the canal and that's all mixed surgeries. And in many cases, the pressure can come down to the mid-teens and the patient may still require some drops, however. If the patient has more advanced disease, however, then I, I go to a blab surgery. And I think that uh, mixed surgery is not enough. In those cases, I typically do pressure flow if they're young, because I find that to be the most successful as far as lowering pressure, but also less invasive, and a good chance to get the pressure down to 12 or 13, as we've shown. That's been our experience here. Uh, great. Uh, does the concentration of the mitomycin differ between phacotrab and trab? I mean, I would say in general, yes, but I have moved toward using 0.4 in most cases anyways, and I don't use 0.5 routinely. So, I mean, I say if you're already using 0.4, I don't typically uh, go higher unless the patient has other risk factors. If they have phacotrab and they're black and they're young, I'll use 0.5 because that patient's at risk uh, for more scarring, especially with phaco. Perfect. Now I'm going through some questions which are uh, actually you, you talked about them already. So I'm checking if anything new. Um, yeah, for I'm how sure. long do you use the steroids after TRAB? I use them at least for two months. It's usually Q2. It's like, again, one week to four weeks pre-op. Q2, and that's QID. Then from the day zero, my patients don't have a patch, no patch. They put the drops on right away after surgery. And it's Q2 hours from day zero to day seven. Uh, mm -hmm. As, as Manir said, if they are not compliant or the eye still red, I'll inject them on top of that with dexamethasone, decadron, um, under the con superiorly. Then after one week, if the eye looks better, they're on QID four times a day for three weeks. Then I see how they're doing. If they're looking good and pressure is good, I will continue to taper them down by one drop every one to two weeks. So by two months, they're basically off the medication. If it's a fake or trab or the eye still red or they have lid margin disease, they're on steroids for longer. That's kind of my regular routine myself. But again, uh, alo alo, alo knows best. <laughs> okay, Dr. Basil from Syria. What is the best time for needling and when needling is useless? Yeah, good question. I mean, I find that in a trab that uh, if I don't have good pressure control in the first month, I need to needle. If suture lysis didn't work, I need to needle to get the, to get the blood flowing. That's my early needling. And then I usually will typically do needling later on if the pressure is above target. Um, I don't think it's an ideal time to not do needling. I do needling at five years later if I have to. I'll do needling at, uh, you know, in the first few months if I have to. If I needle in the first month, I don't use mitomycin, I'll use 5-FU. If I needle after the first month, I'll use mitomycin typically in 0.5, as I said. Um, I usually try to needle, I will not needle if the, if the conge is all avascular, then I don't typically needle. If the conge is really stuck down, I cannot even move it on the sclera, I won't needle. If the patient is really difficult to do in the, in the, in the, in the slit lamp, I'll go to the operating room. I'm going to the operating room, I'll just do a revision. I'm already there, you know, in my, in my hands. And so those are some cases where I, perhaps I avoid needling. But I'm a needler, I'll tell you. I walk around in my office, in my clinic, and my fellows do, with like four or five syringes in my pocket with 27 gauge needles. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, uh, last question from Dr. Ali from Oman. Uh, by the way, congratulations, Dr. Uh, uh, Ahmed. Uh, you have, uh, mashallah, big fans and fr from uh, worldwide. Uh, so, Dr. Ali, Dr. Ali from uh, Oman, um, uh, he says, with sweating bleb, always go for bleb revision or try conservative treatment. If you are with conservative treatment, what is your protocol? Those are tough cases. Um, I know that patients at risk, of course, for endophthalmitis. Uh, here's my strategy. Uh, I use doxycycline, first of all, 
I think that the MMP changes can sometimes help to, uh, to you know, allow for that uh, conjunctival to heal better. That's the first thing I'll do. I will lubricate the eye if there's any issues around that. And I'll try to wait a little bit uh, to try to see if that helps. Second thing I will do is I will do a needling. You may be surprised, but I will do a needling. Why? Because the needling will help to divert the aqueous away from the area where it's sweating to areas posterior where the conjunctiva is better shape. So by doing mitomycin around the bleb, not in the bleb, but around posterior, and then needling the bleb to allow for the fluid to drain more posterior can divert the fluid and the sweating can stop. It can, happen, it can help be helpful for later bleb leaks as well. And I realize, again, this is a bit controversial. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is that sometimes we use aqueous suppression to lower the aqueous production. If the patient doesn't get hypotenuse, it can reduce the pressure head into the bleb and the sweating can get less. The reality is that there's a spectrum, right? I mean, all, most blebs will have some trans-conj flow. It's just not obvious. But when it's obvious, I do warn the patient. I tell them that the eye gets red that they must come back right away. I tell them to get a bottle of antibiotics, keep it with them. If the eye's red, they need to start using it. And I have a good discussion with the patient. In some cases, I leave with the patient. I don't do a revision, but we watch the patient. Other cases, when the pressure may be low even, I'll do a revision. So I am not dogmatic about this yet, but I don't know what others think. Yeah, I have a couple of uh, cases that have leaked for almost five or seven years even. And uh, I just, I, I put them on, uh, on, on uh, gentamicin daily, like uh, just uh, a daily dose, just to irritate, keep irritating the con, and also maybe some antibiotic uh, coverage, you know. And uh, they, they do quite well, as you said, you know, they, I'm not too worried. Yeah. Uh, I, I do have an, a question. Do you have any, do you think there is any role for having the patient massage their eye to, for optimization? Good, I good question. Have, yeah, I found that useful in some patients, not others, but I do qu uh, spend quite a bit of time teaching them how to do it correctly. And uh, especially in the, I found it helpful in the first one week if they start doing it the right way. Yeah, I think long-term bleb uh, compression or bleb ocular compression or bleb massage, as people call it, I don't, I'm not sure that really helps. I don't think it does. And some studies have shown that, that routine bleb massage over many months doesn't really help. I mean, it, the pressure goes up and comes down and then goes back up again. So I find that may be more harmful. So I don't think it's helpful. However, in the first month, it can be diagnostic to tell us where the blood's flowing, whether the plant suture lysis, it can be helpful. Like you said, in the first month, it's gonna be helpful to just encourage the blood to form, especially with Zen, for example, I do that. Uh, the first week, I'm a bit careful in a trap. I worry the patient may push too hard and maybe the, uh, the, the, uh, they may dehist their sutures but depends how gentle you are. And you're absolutely right. We have to teach the patient, uh, you know, how to do this properly. So, but I think long-term, I don't put, I have people who are seeing other specialists and they're doing this every day, four times a day. And, you know, they're doing Salah five times a day and they're doing the massage four times a day. I say, just do it five times a day, like you would do or something. Right. But anyway, I'm just joking, but I think it's too much. It does. I don't, I'm not believe it. I don't believe it helps. I don't believe it helps. And the studies have shown this, I think. And may I ask last question, Ike, if you don't mind? It's uh, with the preserve flow, do you, do you believe in inserting it uh, in the supranasal area to spare this temp uh, supra uh, temporal area just for tube or trap, or you think 12 o'clock is the best? I 100% agree with you. Uh, it seems to be a common theme here, Manir, me and you here, and, and good day. Um, I like to place it in the supranasal quadrant, not at 12 o'clock. The teaching for me has always been place it in the quadrant. Uh, maybe 11 o'clock or one o'clock, not, not like all over nasally, but you know, in the nasal sleep the quadrant. Cause number one, the flow is more posterior. Otherwise if you put it 12 o'clock, the, the, the super rectus muscle is going to block the flow, right? Cause the flow comes out six millimeters back from the limbus. And number two, like you said, save the super temporal quadrant for future surgery if you have to. So any of these surgeries should be done in one quadrant and save the other quadrant. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you very much uh, for the wonderful talk, uh, Aiki. And uh, I would like to thank the panelists for giving part of their valuable time to be with us in this session and for the discussion, fruitful discussion. Um, uh, it is such an honor and pleasure to have you all uh, in this session. And I would like to thank as well all the audience for being with us at, to the end 
and hope to see you all in the next session um, as per the calendar. Thank you again, uh, Aiki, uh, Munir, yeah. and uh, Qudih. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thanks so much again, everyone. Keep well, keep safe. Bye. Take care. Salam, take care. Thanks Bye. everyone for the Salam. questions. Send the Bye. questions over social media if there's more questions. Okay, sure. good. <laughs> very good idea. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good Bye. night, Peace. Have a nice evening. Bye. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome, Salam.